Lieutenant Governor Roden, Mr. Speaker, members of the House and the Senate, Chief Justice Jensen, uh, members of the Supreme Court Justices, constitutional officers, we welcome you and to all of our fellow South Dakotans. My job today is to give you a report on the state of our state. Uh, our state constitution requires me to appear before you and deliver this speech, but it gives little guidance on how long the speech should be or what snacks should be served. So I have decided to take a few liberties. On your desks, you will find a little bag of snacks for me because I like to eat. And you may find that these snacks are reflective of this body. They're a little salty. Sometimes they're sweet, and there may be a nut or two in the bunch. <laughs> so with that, let's get started. First, we have with us several members of our South Dakota National Guard, and they are rock stars, so incredibly proud of them, and we have so many members of the military and veterans from the state of South Dakota. Would all of you please stand so we can give you the honor that is due to you in the service that you have to our great state and our nation. Speaking of great South Dakotans, how about those jackrabbits, right? Back-to-back <laughs> -back champs, right? Okay, I'm going to give you a countdown to three, and we're all going to yell, Go Jacks. You ready? Three, two, one. Go Jacks! I love it. Perfect. The team will love that. We are in a different time than we were just a few short years ago. We talk about what we believe as conservatives, and we've always done that, and the importance of limited government. Low taxes, American values, personal responsibility. But then challenging times hit our state and our country and our world. And we had to decide just how conservative we were really going to be here in South Dakota. Were we just going to talk about limited government and freedom, or were we going to fight for it? Were we going to defend it? Even when it wasn't the popular thing to do, we stood strong on our Constitution and on our state's motto, under God, the people rule. South Dakota is doing better than every other state in this nation because we have embraced our conservative principles. I've often called our state small, more like a pilot project for conservative reforms to prove that they really do work. Our people are thriving and our economy is growing, and our state has never been in a more fiscal situation that is stable. We have cut taxes, we've created jobs together, and we've maximized opportunities. We have also learned that there is a trick to keeping that momentum going. We have learned that we have to tell our story in order to succeed. We can govern conservatively, but we also need to keep our foot on the gas. South Dakota's success is unprecedented, and we have a limited window of time where the eyes of the entire nation are on our state. We cannot miss the opportunity to capitalize on that. South Dakota has proven that conservative policies help families thrive. We've shown that freedom does work here and that we're just getting started. During my second inaugural address last year, I gave a top 10 list of things that surprised me about being governor. Well, I think it's time for another such top list, 10 list. I can't possibly cover for you today all of the wonderful things that are going on here in our state, but I can hit the highlights. So today I'm proud to present to you the top 10 list of things that we are doing in South Dakota to ensure that freedom works here. So let's get started. Number 10, the freedom to keep and bear arms. We protect our Second Amendment rights in South Dakota. Constitutional carry was the very first bill that I signed into law as governor. Two years ago, you all worked with me to make sure that our state was the first in the nation to waive all fees to concealed carry permits. We even pay for people's uh, federal background checks. It doesn't cost South Dakotans a penny to exercise their Second Amendment rights. And last year, I signed an executive order which says that the state will not do business with any financial institution who infringes on Second Amendment rights. We have been able to market our state as a Second Amendment haven. 
My Office of Economic Development is actively working to recruit firearm businesses from states that do infringe on our Second Amendment rights. Last year, California became the first state in America to levy a special tax on guns and ammunition. We immediately invited California gun manufacturers to move here to South Dakota. We've proven that freedom works for those gun manufacturers. They're moving here. They're growing. They're thriving. Coltac and Rapid City, Silencer Central and Sioux Falls, they both had leadership that moved to South Dakota for a better life. These folks have built thriving companies that employ South Dakotans. They help our people exercise their Second Amendment rights. And other companies like HS Precision and Black Hills Ammunition, TS Custom Precision Rifles, they're all a big part of helping this industry grow in South Dakota. Many of those leaders are here today with us. And I'd like to recognize them for being in an industry that's under attack, for standing strong and believing in our Second Amendment rights, and for finding their home right here in South Dakota. So if you would stand and allow us to honor and recognize you for all that you're doing for our economy in South Dakota, that would be fantastic. And we aren't going to stop there. Just last month, our Department of Game, Fish, and Parks broke ground and moving dirt on a world-class shooting range, West River. The South Dakota Shooting Sports Complex will be the premier firearms range in the Midwest. But the Biden administration is undermining this project. They're changing the rules after they had already signed off on it. So. I am going to work with Game Fish and Parks to continue to build this range. We're going to host world-class events here in South Dakota that will impact our, our economy right here in our state long-term. Now, the number nine way that freedom works here is the freedom to enjoy the outdoors. My administration has made it a priority to enhance our outdoor opportunities. Every year, we are ranked one or two for the most hunting licenses sold per capita. My Second Century initiative is expanding opportunities for animal, animal habitat across the state. South Dakota has more than 5 million acres of public access hunting opportunities, even though 80% of our land is privately owned. In 2023, we broke the record for the most private land enrolled in public hunting access. The reason is very simple. It's respect. We respect each other's private property rights. We seek permission to hunt on our neighbor's land before we step foot on their property. And my nest bet predator program is aimed at teaching respect for the outdoors and for the wildlife to our kids and to our grandkids. Every year participants turn in 50,000 tales of predators that would otherwise devastate our pheasant and our wildlife population. This last year, 46% of the participants in that program were under the age of 18. That number continues to steadily increase every single year. We are getting more South Dakota kids involved in trapping and fishing and hunting. And that's a really good thing. In fact, I've got a fun story for you. My Department of Game, Fish, and Parks works every day with families to teach them and their kids how to hunt. For example, this one family, the Gingrich family, they have three children. Uh, would you please stand, Gingrich family, I think you're right over here, while I talk about you, so everybody can stare at you while I tell your story. Now, Morgan is 16, Morgan waved just a little bit, Samantha's 15, William is 13. This family signed up for the Hunting 101 program through the Department of Game, Fish, and Parks. They learned how to navigate GoOutdoorsSD.com to get their licenses. They learned firearm safety, and when they went to practice at the range, they celebrated hitting the 200-yard steel target by having ice cream, which is right after my own heart. That's a celebration that I can get behind. Game Fish and Parks, with the help of a volunteer mentor, worked with them one by one to go out and to attempt to fill their deer tags. Now, first, William, accompanied by his dad, Reuben, had successful harvests. Then Game and Fish worked with Samantha, and Samantha didn't get her deer the first time, I heard, because she might have been a little bit too chatty. Um, but then Morgan harvested, and then Samantha again got her opportunity, and she was successful. 
Finally, Mom Danielle, all five hunters got their deer. As a family, they learned how to process that deer together, prepare the wild game for the table, and now they have the tools and the skills to get back in the field together, make memories, and continue to put that food on their kitchen table. They are still taking classes at the outdoor campus, and the Gingriches are here with us today. Please give them a round of applause for allowing us to tell their story. These kinds of stories are possible because in South Dakota, we respect the freedom to enjoy the outdoors. Number eight way that South Dakota continues to prove that freedom works here is that we have the freedom to farm and ranch. Hunting is fundamental to South Dakota's way of life, but I can think of one thing that is more fundamental, farming. We're top 10 in the country for production of 25 different agriculture communities and commodities. Our farmers, our ranchers provide about 30% of our state's economic output. South Dakota farmers are free to farm and our ranchers are free to ranch. Last year, I brought forward legislation that would have stopped foreign adversaries from purchasing ag land in South Dakota. China and other evil foreign governments are executing a plan to own our ag land and to control our food supply. Although last year's proposal to regulate these purchases didn't pass, we've continued to discuss solutions from all those folks that are involved and impacted. Congress has not taken action. We can't really afford to wait another year. And in just the past decade, China's ownership of American ag land has increased by over 5,300%. It's too important of an issue to our national security to let another year go by and do nothing and let our enemies gain a larger foothold in our economy and in our food supply chain. South Dakota respects the freedom to farm and to ranch. That freedom should not extend to our enemies, which leads us to number seven, the freedom to be secure. One of the biggest reasons that we can't allow America's adversaries like China to own South Dakota ag land is because Ellsworth Air Force Base is going to soon be the home of the next generation bomber. It will keep America safe for decades to come. The B-21 Raider took its first test flight just two months ago, and our enemies are going to do everything that they can to get intelligence on that bomber. It is our duty to do what we must do here in South Dakota to ensure that they fail and that we succeed at keeping America safe. Sometimes keeping people safe means that we need to extend our efforts beyond South Dakota. The Biden administration's failures at the border have been so well documented that I don't need to talk about them in great length here. For the third time in less than three years, South Dakota National Guard troops have gone there to help. When I was there with our soldiers at the border, I saw the inhumanity of Biden's failed policies. Until those policies change, the lack of security at our southern border is making South Dakota less safe here at home. Drugs and human trafficking are devastating our communities. More than 70% of the overdose deaths in America are now caused by fentanyl, and South Dakota is not immune to this. We have led the nation in the decrease in overdose deaths two out of the last three years. We are second lowest in the nation overall. But that doesn't mean we stop there. We have to tackle the rising challenge of fentanyl and address this new drug that is being utilized, utilized called xylazine. It's otherwise known, and you've heard it referred to as the zombie drug. When xylazine is mixed with fentanyl, it makes an already deadly drug even deadlier, and it brings with it a whole host of negative health consequences. My Department of Health is working with our Attorney General and Attorney General Marty Jackley on, is drafting legislation to schedule xylazine as a Schedule Three controlled substance to combat this challenge right here in South Dakota. Now, freedom works here because we have the freedom to also get a second chance. That leads us to our next bullet point. If South Dakotans do get involved in drugs or in another aspect of crime, that should not be the final word on their life. The punishment should match the crime, always. But they also should have the opportunity to be rehabilitated, to become better, to become capable members of our society. 
The new prisons that we're all working on together to construct will help us achieve that. They'll be constructed to provide second chances for people, give us the space we need for different treatment options and opportunities to learn skills. Late last year, I spoke at a graduation for the Sixth Circuit Problem Solving Court. Changed my life to hear the stories that they told that day. There was eight different graduates that were there, all of whom had been sober for a year or more, some alcoholism, some different drugs. They stood up, they shared their stories, they shared their hopes and their dreams for their future, and in fact, more than 150 South Dakotans graduated from this initiative last year. It's a rigorous program. It includes five different phases and requires frequent alcohol and drug testing. It's a proven strategy, though, that reduces recidivism. It saves tax dollars on, in the long run, and it resolves and restores hope and dignity for all of those individuals. We have someone with us today. Her name is Leda Wise Spirit. Leda, where are you? Miss Leda, there you are. She is a wonderful woman who has done incredible things throughout the community. When I spoke at the Problem Solving Court graduation, Lita was recognized by the judges for her contributions and for volunteer work. Lita, thank you for supporting all of those individuals and walking with them through life. Thank you for what you do for people in our state to be their mentor, their support, their prayer partner, and we need more people like you helping us out in this world to help people recover, and to support them through the process of healing. Will you all join me in giving Lay to Wise Spirit a round of applause today? I think everybody knows her. She is, and she's a hugger too, which I love. Unfortunately, we can't provide this type of programming in our old and our overcrowded prisons. Last month, I commuted the sentence of a number of inmates who were qualified and giving them hope of a future. They had been incarcerated with ingestion as their highest offense and they are now on parole. Now they can begin with working with their supervised uh, parole supervisors, they transitioning back into their communities. We will continue to evaluate these second chance opportunities for those who prove that they deserve them. Once individuals are out of custody and they're back into society, we want them to have the opportunity to build a career so that they can provide for themselves and for their families. In the last several years, we have advanced licensure reform as a variety of different ways and paths forward. There's another path that we should take during this legislative session. My Department of Labor and Regulation is bringing legislation to provide second chance licensing opportunities. This bill creates a set of standards to consider criminal histories and any possible rehabilitation by applicants and licensees. We need more plumbers, we need more electricians, more welders, and an unrelated criminal past shouldn't stop qualified applicants from filling these roles. Number five, the freedom to be respected. Providing these kinds of opportunities is about dignity, but it's also about respect. We should respect every single person as an individual, as an equal, as an American. Tomorrow is State Tribal Relations Day. We will advance an effort that I have been working on since I have become governor. Tomorrow we will hang tribal flags in the rotunda of this capital. Three years ago, I signed a legislation that allowed our state's nine Native American tribes to have their respective tribal flags hang in honor in our state's capital rotunda. We will hang the first of those flags, the flags of Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Our tribes are part of who we are as South Dakotans. We respect their heritage, and I invite you all to attend that ceremony tomorrow. We will also continue to support the freedom of our Jewish and our Israeli neighbors who need to be respected. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists committed atrocities against the nation of Israel, some of which are so savage that they are unspeakable. Since then, further hate and discrimination has occurred in America at an increased rate of 388% over the last year. College campuses across the country have become breeding grounds for disgusting anti-Semitic acts. 
Recently, there have even been some isolated incidences right here in South Dakota. The more it happens, the more it will be normalized. We must stop it before that happens. And I am so proud to support legislation that will come this year to define anti-Semitism to make it easier to prove when conduct is motivated by anti-Semitism. It strengthens our anti-discrimination laws. It ensures that our allies and that our citizens are safe and that they will be protected. Number four, the freedom to learn. This includes supporting the teachers who give our kids the opportunity to learn. Teacher salaries have not kept up with increased funding to education. After this year, we will have raised funding to K-12 in South Dakota by more than 26% since I have been your governor. But teacher pay lags far behind, and our teachers deserve better. Yes, I know that schools have their own challenges, but I also know this. The blue ribbon recommendation wasn't just that teacher pay would go up. The blue ribbon promise was that teachers would be the first priority, that they would be paid more. So let's do it. In my budget address last month, I discussed the particular success of a program that is called the Jobs for America's Graduates Program, which is preparing at-risk high school students for college or career once they graduate. These students are accomplishing incredible things. We have with us here today one student that I am confident will accomplish fantastic things in the life that is ahead of her. Melina Shields, and she said I could call her Mel, she is sitting right up here today if you want to stand, Melina, is the first and current statewide president of JAG South Dakota. She's a junior at Lyman High School in Presho. She has represented South Dakota at the JAG National Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C. twice. And because of her visits to D.C., she is interested in pursuing a degree in political science and in business, and perhaps one day representing South Dakota in a leadership role. Maybe you can have this job, Mel. It'd be great, right? She is working with other Lyman JAG students to coordinate a community meal for the town of Lower Brule, which will be held this month. Mel has faced some challenges in her life. She could have let that stop her from succeeding. But because of her own hard work and the support of the JAG initiative, she's setting herself up for a lifetime of success and a bright, bright future. Please join me in giving Mel a round of applause today. When students graduate, we want them to have every opportunity open and available to them. Some of them will jump right into a career, and that's great. Some of them will go to one of our tech colleges, and we have some of the very best tech colleges in the nation. Some will go to college, some might even join our National Guard and then go to college. The young adults that make up that brave choice to raise their right hand and to serve our nation deserve our utmost respect. They deserve our thanks and our support. Last year, this body worked with me to extend tuition for South Dakota National Guardsmen and women to 100% at our state universities. I'm asking you to finish the job and to extend that opportunity to soldiers and airmen who choose to go to private colleges here in South Dakota as well. That leads me to number three. The ways that freedom works here is the freedom to be healthy. In South Dakota, we value living a healthy life no matter where you live. Every South Dakotan should have the freedom to live where they want but they shouldn't have to choose between a rural way of life and good, successful health outcomes. In rural communities, emergency responders are sometimes the only local health care providers that they have. They often show up at our very worst moments, but the nationwide EMT turnover rate is at 36%, and in South Dakota, nearly 90% of our emergency medical services are done by volunteers. I've worked to support the dedicated men and women of this critical workforce. For the past two years, my Department of Health has been working to advance EMS access to our state with a $20 million investment, 
We have put brand new state-of-the-art Life Pack 15s in the back of ambulances across South Dakota. We've also worked with Indian Health Services to get those devices at no charge in ambulances and in their crews in Eagle Butte and in Pine Ridge. We also just completed a comprehensive analysis of the current state of EMS in South Dakota. We had over 400 stakeholder meetings over the course of eight months. Later this year, the Department of Health will roll out a $7.5 million grant program to ambulance services. This effort is going to support the implementation of regional hubs and much more. EMS transport times range from a few minutes to over an hour. During those transports, EMS professionals are in the back of the ambulance. They're caring for a patient, oftentimes they're alone. South Dakota changed that. We are the first state in the country to implement telemedicine in motion. That means we're using telemedicine to connect physicians, nurses, and paramedics with the EMS personnel that are in the field. We work with our partners at Avell eCare to do it, and there's nothing else like it in the country. It is saving lives. Nearly 90 ambulance services throughout the state have installed telemedicine in motion. One of the first major calls to telemedicine in motion came last December. A rancher who was out caring for his buffalo was attacked by one of his animals. His injuries were life-threatening. He had dozens of injuries from the horns and the hooves of the animal, multiple broken ribs, lungs were filling up with blood, his neck was broken, and much more. After pulling himself into his front end loader and driving back home for help, he was picked up by the local EMS agency who connected with the Avell team via telemedicine. An onboard certified physician and nurses were available on camera to help stabilize the rancher. They coordinated with the receiving hospital. They activated the care flight team to expedite the transfer to the patient to Sioux Falls. Once the EMS crew arrived at the hospital, the Avell maintained their support of the patient since Avell emergency was installed in the hospital's ER. After the patient recovered, he shared feedback with his care team. He said, they held my life in their hands and then they gave it back to me, something that I will forever be grateful for. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome that Buffalo rancher and outfitter from Gan Valley, Jim Luter, along with his wife, Cindy, who is here with us today. Would you please stand? Jim is still here with us today, thanks to the dedicated work of Ed Konechki from Kimball Ambulance Service and our telemedicine and motion partners from Avell eCare in Sioux Falls. Ed is just a volunteer, but he saved Jim's life that day, and he did it with the help of Dr. Katie DeYoung, along with nurse Casey Hunter, who are on the Avell team. And today, I have a very special announcement that I would like to make. I would like to honor Ed and Dr. Katie and Casey with the Governor's Award of Heroism for thanking them for the incredible action that they took that day to save Jim's life and for all that they do for all the people here in South Dakota. So congratulations, thank you so much for being this year's recipient of the Governor's Award of Heroism. Please stand. These efforts are an investment in the future of EMS, but more importantly, they're saving lives. We're down to number two. The second way that freedom works here is it provides for the freedom for life. In order to have a healthy life, we must first have the freedom to get off to the right start. The freedom extends to every single, listen to that, that's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> That freedom extends to every single South Dakotan before they're born, after they're born, until the day that they die. Later this week, I will proclaim that 2024 will be the Freedom for Life year in South Dakota. 
The most important way that we will advance this is by taking care of both moms and their babies before birth and after. Being pro-life doesn't mean that you value the child's life before their birth and throughout their life. It means that you're valuing and protecting that mother's life as well. The first 1,000 days of a child's life, from the moment that they're conceived until their second birthday, are the most significant days of their development. Research in the fields of neuroscience, biology, and early childhood development has given us powerful insights into how nutrition, relationships, behaviors, and environments in the first 1,000 days shape future outcomes. Mom and baby must both be well-nourished and cared for. That will lead to healthy physical, emotional, and mental growth as a child's brain and body grows and develops. For instance, poor nutrition in the first 1,000 days can cause irreversible damage to a child's growing brain. It affects their future in school and beyond. It can also set up the stage for later obesity or diabetes, other chronic health problems. It can even contribute to the next generation's risk of poverty and poor health and behavioral outcomes. If a baby is exposed to drug use, alcohol, or tobacco use, poor health environments, or sexually transmitted diseases, it is, if there is a lack of even good hygiene in the home, lack of prenatal care and well child visits, if the mother's, child's mother is abused, if the child does not have a sleep, sleep environment, each of these can have countless negative impacts on that baby's future. We care about the lives of our mothers and our children. We have dedicated resources and time to this. We can still do more to prevent the rising death rates of South Dakota moms and babies, particularly among our Native Americans living in tribal lands. So what we're doing here in South Dakota, we are offering the Bright Star program. And it's to get one-on-one -on -one nursing services to first-time moms and to their babies from pregnancy until the child's second birthday. The Department of Social Services Pregnancy Health Home will offer care coordination to all pregnant mothers who are enrolled in Medicaid. These moms also have access to prenatal and postpartum coverage for up to a year after birth with well child and health maintenance programs and exams. The majority of infant deaths can be directly tied to unsafe sleep environments. So Department of Health has provided safe, safe sleep recommendations and education to new and to expecting parents. We help moms and families that struggle with smoking, with drugs, and alcohol addiction. And DSS will provide help for pregnant moms struggling with substance abuse disorder, along with them and holding them accountable through their treatment as well. We're doing all of this and so much more to help moms and families and their babies before their birth and after. You can find all of this information on life.sd.gov. Moms can go there to answer questions about pregnancy, parenting, available financial resources, adoption, and more. The number one way that we here in South Dakota can show and can talk about the fact that freedom works here is by providing an opportunity for people to have the freedom to work. That's my final bullet point for today. This is what America was built on. South Dakota will continue to remind the rest of the country the value of hard work and the dignity that it brings when you do. We have the freedom to get up every single morning and to provide for ourselves and for our families. That's the American dream. I always say that South Dakotans are some of the hardest working people that I know. We still understand the value of hard work. And my goal as governor has never been to create a government that does everything for people, but to create a government that empowers our people to do things for themselves. When a global pandemic hit, many states closed down. South Dakota, we just kept working. While other states were experiencing record high unemployment rates, we broke the national record for the lowest state employment just last year. 
We're creating opportunities for people to get into the career of their dreams. Last year, we announced an effort to expand apprenticeship opportunities for professions across the state. We wanted to give workers an opportunity to get trained for a career while still bringing home a paycheck to their family. We wanted to give businesses the support that they needed to start and to expand apprenticeship programs. In just the first two quarters since launching the expanded effort, we've more than doubled the amount of apprenticeships from recent years, and we're just getting started. I knew that if we could just tell our story, that freedom-loving Americans from across the country would want to be a part of what we're doing here. I knew that it, we needed to celebrate our success and then take the opportunity to capitalize on it, to build on it. I knew we had to show that all of America, that freedom does work here in South Dakota. We're continuing our workforce recruitment campaign. This campaign is only six months old. We've received thousands of applicants interested in moving to our state through this program, not counting those who independently made the move. Thousands have already moved here, and the ads have been viewed by more than 850 million people and times nationwide. We did some research into some of the most needed professions in South Dakota. The results were professions like electricians, plumbers, welders, and even accountants. So we've targeted ads towards those professions. After our first round of ads, I had businesses asking how they could help us keep the campaign going. It quickly became clear that these ads were working and that we needed to do more. Last week, we partnered with Avira, with Monument, and with Sanford to roll out the latest ads to recruit nurses to our state. That is our single highest number of job openings that we need to fill. These ads are so successful because all they do is tell South Dakota's story. Our state licensing boards are reporting huge increases of out-of-state applicants seeking licenses in South Dakota, including a 78% increase in plumbers, a 44% increase in electricians, a 43% increase in accountants. Our labor force has grown by more than 10,000 people in just the last year. Our license recognition bill combined with the microphone of Freedom Works here is a powerful tandem to fill those much needed jobs. That is a story that many people across this country have never heard before. Folks are moving here in record numbers to become a part of our winning way of life. Californians and New Yorkers have never seen a state like ours, a state that actually trusts its people, one that embraces and promotes liberty and freedom. This is indisputably the most impactful workforce campaign in South Dakota's history. And there you have it. That is my top 10 reasons why freedom works here in South Dakota. I'm sure there are more, though in fact, there are probably 900,000 more reasons why freedom works here. Because every single resident of South Dakota represents our way of life, our God-given rights and our freedoms that we hold so dear. I will continue to challenge the status quo. I will continue to push for innovation. I will look for out-of-box solutions. Be prepared. Look at everything our state has accomplished in the last five years. We would not be where we are today, experiencing the growth that we have been experiencing the last several years, if we had not figured out a way to keep our momentum of our success going. I'm not going to slow down. We can't afford it, not when people are flocking here by the thousands to be like us, not when we are the few beacons of hope left in this country. Freedom works here. Our people are thriving because of it. I want to thank you for all of your hard work that you do to help lead this state. May God richly bless you and your family, and may God continue to bless the great state of South Dakota. Have a wonderful day.